All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know these are kind of unprecedented times, but um, hopefully you're learning, uh, you're using this time to uh, go and learn. I know I've taken advantage of the American Speech and Hearing um, opening up their uh, learning um, posts so that we can um, use this time wisely when we are sheltered in. Um, I must say that maybe on the national news, you're hearing that Iowa is being naughty and not sheltering in, but I wanted to tell you that we are being good and we are participating in the shelter in, so um, do not think badly of Iowa at this point. Uh, so uh, I have been a speech pathologist for 30 years and uh, the last 22 I've spent with a large otolaryngology practice in Des Moines. Um, I've been very, very blessed to be, uh, they've kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do. And so I have um, gotten, I've made a professional voice clinic and also a dysphagia clinic um, in my time here. So uh, what I hope to um, have happen today is hopefully there's some speech pathologists here that I can um, get you interested in understanding uh, more about lymphedema and how it impacts our head and neck cancer patients. And then for the physicians and um, PTs and OTs that are joining us, hopefully you'll learn about internal swelling and how that impacts our patients as well. So we are going to kick this off. Um, here is my disclosure statement. Um, my goals for today would be understanding how lymphedema in the head and neck is different from lymphedema of the extremities, um, identifying three symptoms which may indicate internal lymphedema for physicians and for PTs and OTs that are seeing them already, and then learning optimal ways to treat these patients. All right, so I'm super excited about this. This is almost like a game show. And so we are going to be doing um, poll questions and there's several kind of scattered through the whole thing. And so um, poll question number one, I am currently treating patients as a head and neck cancer, treating head and neck cancer patients as a, and this will let us know, let me know um, who is here and how many of you and what percentage um, we are seeing. Um, this is kind of exciting. I feel like Bob Barker on the game show. So right now, lymphedema therapists are in the lead. Um, oh, other. I'm not sure. It'll be interesting. Like we, I need to know who the other people are. And so um, maybe type in under a question um, other because I didn't expect that because there's quite a few other people. But good showing from the speech therapist. That's awesome at 21%. Yay. Not to leave out the, the physicians and the nurse. So we're glad you're here too. Um, thank you so much for joining us. All right, so the poll is closed. Um, so lymphedema therapist is in the lead at 40% and then other, um, and I'm not sure who, who else would be interested in this, but it'll be interesting to see um, who reports in and, and what they do. All right. So these are the patients. Um, this should look familiar to all of you if you tr are treating head and neck cancer. Um, this is pretty typical look after laryngectomy. Um, this is my favorite turkey waddle. I say that with all the love in the world. Um, lots of our patients develop this little turkey waddle. And then this is really significant um, lymphedema involving the face. And I would imagine he's got quite a bit of swelling in the tongue and the epiglottis as well. Airway's been impacted, so he has a trach. Um, so this is the face of our patients. Uh, what is the lymphatic system? I know PTs and OTs, um, you guys have a much better understanding of this. Um, so this is a diagram of um, what the lymphatic system looks like with the lymph nodes. Um, and I think for speech therapists, we need to kind of think of it almost like blood vessels and arteries, where it's a system that travels throughout the body. It goes from the head to the toe. Um, the function of this, though, is fluid balance, absorption, transport, and immunological function. Um, and then basically it acts to filter and detoxify um, damaged cells, cellular debris, viruses, bacteria, and toxins. So it's kind of like a garbage pickup. And um, right now, like I am on um, 
like I've been placed on furlough, so I'm not working very much. I'm doing a few telehealth visits here and there, um, but I'm pretty sure the garbage collectors are necessary and they're working. So that goes to show um, who's working in the pandemic. So next, um, this is kind of a close up of the head and neck and uh, fully one third of the body's lymph nodes are concentrated in the head and the neck. And um, as you know, all of the treatments that we do for head and neck cancer, they all impact uh, this system. And that goes on to cause uh, lymphedema and then later uh, fibrosis. So symptoms of lymphedema in the head and the neck. Uh, certainly dysphagia is the number one symptom that people get. And this, as we know, um, has such huge impacts on the quality of life later on. Like everything, uh, everything good in our lives, I feel like, every holiday, it all uh, revolves around food and around eating and the pleasure that goes along with that. And so um, that is the most important thing after killing the cancer. The next thing is swallowing. Um, oftentimes people describe pain or discomfort or tightness, um, feeling scarring or fibrosis on the outside, reduced range of movement. Um, sometimes difficulty breathing can be a sign of internal lymphedema if there's swelling around like the arytenoids and the true vocal folds. Um, obviously swelling internally or externally and then sometimes there's pretty significant voice changes or it's called dysphonia, which is hoarseness. All right, second poll question. How do you currently treat or manage your patients with head and neck lymphedema? Um, I know as a speech pathologist, uh, before I started learning more about lymphedema, I would look at them and say, you need to go see a manual therapist. Like, go, 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 go. And um, now I am getting much more comfortable in understanding the disease and uh, what I have to offer. So I feel like the two novel things that I want to introduce to speech pathologists especially would be um, the great results that I'm having with uh, myofascial release. I know PTs and OTs, that's old news to you, but uh, I think in the speech therapy realm, uh, myofascial release is pretty new, maybe five, maybe 10 years, but um, there's only a couple PTs that are teaching that. Um, I'm thankful for them. The ones that I know about would be Walt Fritz and uh, John Kelly through Chow. I've taken both of the classes and um, really that has been life-changing or it has altered how I treat patients, um, you know, my voice patients and my head and neck cancer patients. All right, so sharing poll results, it looks like the winner is compression, lymphedema therapy, and the FlexiTouch, yay! Um, there's some that aren't treating any with any people with head and neck cancer yet. Um, compression only, uh, compression and lymphedema therapy kind of in the middle, and then um, I have trouble managing. And um, for sure, I feel like we have trouble managing these patients. And you can see that with the long-term um, quality of life uh, surveys that are taken and um, we know that they're struggling for sure. All right. So we're gonna jump out of there and keep going. So um, why have I gotten on this bandwagon? So this is, um, this is getting kind of really personal to me because now I'm starting to see such young people. Back in the day, you know, 30 years ago when I started uh, practicing, who were the head and neck cancer patients? They were uh, these old men that smoked three packs a day and were alcoholics. And that, like, that was the face of head and neck cancer. And so, um, Usually they didn't live for 10 years after their diagnosis just because of all the other comorbidities that they had. And so, um, you know, it was rare to see someone living a really long time after this diagnosis. Um, but now with HPV, now these people are young, like they're in their 30s. I've got a total glossectomy who's 42. He has an eight year old daughter at home. Um, and he's, you know, obviously had a huge surgery, chemo radiation. Um, like, what is his quality of life going to be, you know, when he's 60 or even when he's 50? Um, 
yeah, so this is the reason why um, we need to understand this disease and then get very proactive in treating it. All right, presence, prevalence of lymphedema. Um, this was super shocking to me because I thought that uh, initially that that internal swelling that we saw was was just swelling and that over time it went away but lymphedema is this chronic disease process and I think that um, PTs and OTs understand this like working with breast cancer patients um, where they've got uh, significant swelling in their arm after they've you know messed with the lymph nodes um, uh, but like that happens in the head and neck too. And so when you see this internal swelling, if there's not treatment of that, then that goes on to get fibrotic um, later on. And so fully 90% of the patients had um, lymphedema, both internal and external lymphedema, and over half of them developed fibrosis, which is crazy numbers. All right, so dysphagia. Um, after combined radiation and um, chemotherapy, we know as speech therapists that every single part of the swallow is impacted by these treatments. There's not a portion of the swallowing that isn't impacted from the oral phase, um, increased oral phase, decreased tongue base retraction, reduced hyolaryngeal excursion, reduced pharyngeal contraction, impaired epiglottic inversion, and then the esophagus doesn't open very well. Uh, other things that are also have a significant impact on quality of life, trismus, I can't open my mouth, I can't eat a hamburger because I can't open my mouth, um, mucositis, huge ulcerative lesions, um, pain with swallowing, dry mouth, um, changes to taste and smell. It's all this big cascade of things and what happens, they stop eating, they stop swallowing. Um, and then that causes this other cascade of um, problems later on. All right, so I'm going to show, it might have been a few years um, since we've had anatomy and physiology, and so I'm going to do just a quick review of a happy voice box here. Uh, so we are looking here would be the front of the patient, back of the patient, right side, and left side. Base of tongue, or this is also called the lingual tonsil. Um, epiglottis, this is the aryepiglottic fold. Piriform sinuses are here, these pockets. Um, this is called the postcricoid region. And then the opening of the esophagus or the UES is right here. And then we come around to the right piriform sinus uh, on this side. And then the next picture is just kind of a woo, close up of right true vocal fold, left true vocal fold, subglottic shelf. This is the first tracheal ring. Um, these are called the false vocal folds. And um, these are called the arytenoid cartilages that act to open and close the vocal folds as we breathe and then as we talk. All right, so uh, measuring lymphedema. I know that PTs and OTs and um, physicians are pretty used to measuring external swelling, um, graded typically from zero to three, I think. Um, and then fibrosis. Um, I know fibrosis, uh, back in the day we called it a woody neck. Believe it or not, that isn't very nice, but um, that was how, that was what we called it 30 years ago. And we called it a woody neck because it felt like wood. Um, now, internal swelling is becoming very, very important to me. Um, and I sometimes say to my patients, I don't really care what you look like on the outside, I care what you look like on the inside. And so um, I'm doing endoscopy frequently, checking for this internal swelling. Um, believe it or not, there's only one scale that I was able to find called the Patterson scale for rating internal swelling. Um, for speech pathologists, if you don't have the ability to drop a scope and um, do an endoscopy procedure, then please, please, please get to be buddies with the ENT, um, our radiation doctors will oftentimes pass a scope um, looking at the internal swelling. Uh, so we need to find out how the structures on the inside are doing. This is again rated from mild to severe, mild, moderate, and severe. All right, so now this was, um, this was the most severe picture that I've ever seen of internal lymphedema. Um, so you can see that this is the epiglottis. Um, this is that area epiglottic fold. This is the post cricoid region. You cannot even see their true vocal folds. So what symptoms would he be having? He's probably having some shortness of breath. Um, what do you think his swallow looks like? Well, like 
the piriform sinuses are now obliterated, the vollicula is obliterated. So this epiglottis isn't inverting, I guarantee it. So what happens? The food and liquid dump right into the laryngeal vestibule. Um, so significant, significant dysphagia. Uh, this is just a little bit closer up where you can um, see, you know, it's just so crazy swollen. Again, what I didn't understand is that this disease is a continuum, that once they get this swollen, then that means that they have lymphedema and they will have a chronic progression forever. Like this will impact him forever. Uh, and this is just comparing to a normal happy voice box. Uh, so polling question again. What patient below had the swollen anatomy we just saw? So this is a gentleman, um, you can see very obvious external swelling um, of the face. This is called submental region. Uh, he does have a trach, so they were worried about his airway at some point. Um, and so we're going, going, going. Big money, big money. What patient below had the swollen anatomy we just saw? So patient A, oh, you guys are so good. You knew where this was going. So um, you did, you guessed right. So this, this lady is tiny, like she weighs 100 pounds dripping wet. Um, really no external swelling at this point, but it was her. Um, this is her, what she looks like on the inside. So I feel like internal swelling is kind of tricky. Like it can be... Um, it can stand alone. It can um, come along with the external swelling. So you can sometimes have both internal and external, or you can just have external, or you can just have internal. Takeaway message is you don't know until you look. So that, uh, that's super important. Uh, this is just a quick slide of what I typically do in my practice. And I stole Swallowing Boot Camp from MD Anderson. Um, MD Anderson has a ton that they've published on head neck cancer. Um, they've been very prolific. And so um, if you want to look at more, um, there's some on the ASHA website as well. Um, so I perform a fees on these patients um, before they start their treatment. And a lot of times you can see the impact of the um, tumor on the swallow. Um, even if there's no complaint, uh, I forget the exact number, but I think it's like 70% of the patients that uh, before they start treatment are already having some dysphagia. Um, next thing is start the pharyngocyte exercise program proactively. So if you aren't seeing them proactively, then you need to get with your get with the radiation oncologist. Um, I have like a PowerPoint that I've gone and, and talked to them, um, and it's pretty impactful, like showing them what I've been showing you. Um, so my pharyngocyte exercises involve Mendelssohn, maximum mandibular jaw opening, supraglottic swallow, masaka, and effortful swallow. Practicing three times a day, 10 repetitions. Um, they have to do that. And I'm like, I'm kind of like this guy up here. I'm like, rah, you have to do this. Um, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Um, I start myofascial release. A lot of times I do some intraoral work um, for trismus. Uh, John Kelly went through some things with um, xerostomia. And um, I tell them, I do not want you to come in here spitting in a cup. But unfortunately, there's a good percentage of them that do come in spitting in a cup where they are no longer swallowing. Um, sometimes they keep doing my exercises, which is better than not, obviously, but um, sometimes they stop everything. Uh, I then do a fees at the completion of the treatment once they're stable. Um, initiate referral to CLT um, and flex a touch. Continue the myofascial release usually for about eight weeks. Um, and then as needed, we'll uh, pull in a therabyte and then the EMST for um, airway protection. All right. So this is the first of my case studies. Um, this is Mike, we're gonna call him. Mike had a nasty tumor of the base of his tongue. And so this is the first time that we saw him. Uh, this is the base of the tongue. You can see the epiglottis here. Um, 
he has actually three strikes against him. And so I, I'm starting to think of this with um, like how many strikes they have against them and what um, additional therapy and modalities we need to utilize. And so we know from the literature that um, people who have more than one modality, if they have chemo and radiation, they are going to have a more impact on their swallow. Um, also, when you add in um, surgery, it can be extensive surgery like radical neck or um, some type of a flap versus just a, a free closure. Um, that obviously has more of an impact. And so he had combined chemo radiation therapy, one strike. He had extensive surgery. He's had maybe like four or five surgeries on the base of his tongue because it keeps lighting up, unfortunately, under the PET scan. Um, and then Mike was naughty and he did not continue to do his, he'd stopped eating and drinking for probably six weeks and then um, didn't do the exercises either. So Mike, I feel like is this perfect storm of someone who would be a good candidate for the FlexaTouch or the pneumatic compression device. Um, this is a picture right after he was finished um, with his radiation and chemotherapy. Um, you see this a lot, I feel like, where the base of the tongue kind of disappears. And it's probably a combination of disuse atrophy, it's called, where they're not swallowing. Um, and I think a little bit of it is where the radiation kind of melts away the lymphatic tissue. Years ago, they used radiation um, to cure, to do like an adenoidectomy, like up into the early 60s. And so we know that radiation therapy kind of melts away that lymphoid tissue. And so sometimes you see the base of the tongue atrophying and just melting away. Um, with the, uh, with the FlexaTouch with him, I feel like the advantages that you gain from doing the Fringo Size program and the FlexaTouch um, are numerous. We know the benefits of the Fringo Size are better base of tongue and epiglottic movement, shorter duration of a peg, uh, preservation of muscle mass that we can see on MRI, improved mouth opening, um, superior diet levels where they can go back to eating meat and uh, bread and even like raw vegetables and then less aspiration and hospitalization later on and so those are all wrapped up um, in the benefits that we're seeing. Uh, case study number two. So I like to call these patients my freshy patients and so I'm trying to show you kind of a continuum uh, today. So I have these two. This is another fresh out of treatment guy. Um, this guy did pretty much everything right until the end. And so he, um, he did not have alternative feeding, so he did not have a peg. Um, he kept eating a pretty normal diet, uh, did my exercises, um, and this is him um, after his treatments. And his biggest complaint was actually taste. Uh, he had combined modalities, so he had chemo and radiation. Um, pretty extensive radical neck surgery. Um, and so I thought that he also would be a good candidate because he's young for the FlexaTouch for long term. Um, and he was super good about using the FlexaTouch. Um, this is a really interesting, so it, he got busy. Um, he's a big cook, like he loves to cook. And around Thanksgiving, he had a big family thing going on. And so he stopped. We had been discharged from speech and from his manual therapist. Um, and the only thing he was doing was the FlexaTouch. He stopped using the FlexaTouch for two weeks. Uh, he called me in a panic and he said, I cannot swallow. And you can see what happened is that then he developed significant lymphedema of his epiglottis. Um, and then look at this, like it just blew up, just like poof from um, initially with regular use and then after discontinuing use of it. Um, and it was crazy. So uh, we got him back in. I did some more, a little bit more myofascial release, got him back into his manual therapist, um, got him obviously back using the FlexaTouch uh, a couple times a day. And um, he was back to his baseline in probably about a month. Um, and he, interestingly, he not only had significant internal edema, but he also had moderate at least um, external lymphedema as well. 
All right, case study number three. Um, this is a gal, and this is, uh, it looks different because I'm using the pediatric scope. So she's this big, like she's just a little, a little tiny lady. And um, so she had combined chemo radiation. She did not have um, extensive surgery. Um, but she had quit eating and drinking and doing the exercises in the middle. So she had two strikes against her. Um, she came to me, unfortunately, this is literally like at her five year, I'm cured, celebrating point, where now she says, I am having trouble swallowing. Uh, the food is getting caught. I have to drink it down each time. And we know that that is trouble. And so we need to intervene at that point. Um, so this is her first fees. This is, she's eating, we color the food during a fees, we color it green um, so that we can see it. And you can see that, where is it sitting? Sitting at the base of the tongue um, in the vollecula. And that's a very typical place for it to sit. Sometimes you see it diffusely throughout the hypopharynx, but a lot of times it's just here. Um, and then, so she is my age, um, but she has a job that um, like is just crazy. She just adopted her grandchild. And so there's so many things we know that kind of preclude people for, from going into therapy, whether it's speech therapy or PT or OT, where, whether it's copays or transportation. A lot of our patients can't come to see us. Um, and so she said, well, what, what's, what do I do? Um, you know, in the past, I would have been like, ah, I got nothing, but now uh, I have the FlexiTouch. And so um, I saw her, she uh, obtained the FlexiTouch and she was using it twice a day. Um, and interestingly, I saw her about a month into it. And the first thing that she said to me was her dentist had asked her what she was doing because her teeth were in better condition because there was more saliva. Um, why is there more saliva? It's stimulating the parotid gland and the submandibular glands. And so this is, um, this is something that I'm hearing regularly with uh, both my myofascial release and with the FlexiTouch, that there's an increase in um, salivary production. And so dentist is happy, um, she is happy, she didn't have a water bottle with her and that's the first time that I've seen her not having a water bottle. Sorry, that was my timer. Um, so um, obviously this has made a significant impact on her swallowing where we went from severe residue to like very minimal to mild residue. Um, this is just secretions um, after that. All right, so continuum of care. Um, we are with the patients, um, speech pathologists, we are in it for the long haul. Like we are a lot of times the first patient uh, first person that they call because we're there at the very beginning doing um, proactive or prehab we call it um, supportive care we're there during being the cheerleader ah keep eating and then um, certainly after we jump in and then the other specialties jump in as well and then long term um, the FlexiTouch like I am so excited about the FlexiTouch I'm hoping that this is going to stop that severe fibrosis that we see um, long term where you know they can't swallow they get a trach because their vocal folds are paralyzed like we have seen that really really severe fibrosis um, where do we go from here uh, be proactive with treatment for dysphagia. Make sure you're getting in there. Um, if you're not getting in there, then go talk to them because there's very, um, there's very good evidence that they should be looking at and listening to that we need to be at this table. Um, please recognize both internal and external lymphedema. Um, interestingly, I dropped a scope down. I had a patient doing a demo and he had mild to moderate internal swelling. Um, and after just one treatment or the demonstration, I dropped the scope down again, and you could see a visible difference. And so um, manual therapy and the FlexiTouch are being helpful for the internal edema as well. And I think, um, like, how weird would that be for PTs and OTs to um, see a patient when they don't have any external swelling, but say, oh, I guess I'm working on the internal swelling now. Um, lastly, start treatment early with manual therapy and plan for long-term treatment to prevent fibrosis. All right, uh, poll question. When shelter-in-place subsides and we are back to normal, 
uh, what do you look forward to the most? And this will be interesting. Getting together with family and friends. Yeah, yeah, that's a, yep. Yeah, I'm excited to go out to eat too. Um, I can kind of do some of my outside stuff. I have horses and four wheelers. And so I have been able to go out and mess around with my horses. Um, and on this is a big weekend for Easter. I'll be looking forward to getting back with my Sunday school class and my church groups too. So um, that is wonderful. But I know, you know, getting together with, you know, parents and aunts and uncles and cousins will be absolutely the best part. All right, so um, this is a picture of the Flexa Touch, and I know that it looks kind of crazy, um, but if you have watched a manual therapist um, dealing with uh, swelling in the head and the neck, you'll know that they start um, actually under the armpit. And so this device mimics what they do, like it mimics their hands and what happens. And so um, it starts um, decongesting in the chest and then it goes to the head and then pulls everything down in kind of this big sweeping movement. Um, and it's kind of like just a gentle massage. If you haven't um, ever seen it, uh, get in touch with a rep and have them come and they'll put it on you and it feels quite lovely. Um, I have a lot of my patients that say, I fall asleep. Um, I do it while I'm watching TV. Uh, I know for the extremities, a lot of times they uh, will only use it once a day, but a lot of my patients with the head and neck device will use it um, twice a day at least, or sometimes before meals because they can swallow better and easier after the treatment. Uh, okay, so I should probably stop talking and take some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Joy, for sharing such beneficial education and your experiences with us this morning. We'd like to transition to our Q&A time, and as a reminder, you all can still continue to submit questions through the Q&A icon. And Joy, your first question is in. Uh, our guest shares, as an SLP, I feel head and neck lymphedema treatment is outside my scope of practice. What made you feel confident in treating lymphedema? Well, like I feel like I'm not, like I have personally not gone and taken like the advanced head and neck lymphedema course. I'm, I would like to do that in the future. Um, I think myofascial release and my exercises, like I think what we do has an impact on the lymphedema for sure, um, because we know that exercise and movement is helpful. Um, I think what gives me confidence is that I am working on the inside and that we are very familiar with. And so I feel like we need to bring that more to the forefront um, because no one knows this better than us. Like no one knows the inside better than us. And so that qualifies us. And I think right now, no one is talking about this. And so we need to be the ones that um, come to the table and say, this is super important and this will affect their swallowing forever. So you are qualified to do this. Fantastic, Joy. Thank you for that confidence. Another guest asks, how long do you recommend that people do swallowing exercises after completion of their chemo and radiation therapy? Well, you know, I, um, I will typically do my myofascial release for about two weeks, two, uh, two months, about eight weeks. Um, and then I tell them like, I'd really like you to keep doing the swallowing exercises forever, but I'm sure PTs and OTs are like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So we know that, you know, there just isn't a huge, uh, like some, a few people do that, but I think the vast majority of people, um, once they go back to living and doing their normal thing, uh, they, there isn't a big compliance. Um, there's not a huge level of compliance with that. I feel like though with a device, like even the EMST, I feel like when they have something, a tool or device that they're more likely to, to continue to do that. Um, so I'm hopeful that with this device um, that will show greater compliance than just having them do things on their own. Very nice. This is a good follow-up question. How soon after treatment, surgery and radiation, et cetera, do you recommend trialing a FlexiTouch with a patient? Well, the company says that as, 
as soon as there's not any kind of open ulcerations or open sores, um, if the skin is healthy, then they can do a trial. And so, um, you know, usually it's pretty quick, like within a week or two of completion. Um, I don't have a lot of patients who have a huge breakdown in their skin. Uh, obviously it's different if they've had like a huge surgery, radical neck, you have to wait for the okay from the physicians. But um, if the skin is intact, um, I usually do it quick. Exactly. Yes. And then also, of course, um, you're working very closely with the physician on that time frame too. Yes. Yeah. They have to give the okay before the, we do the demo. Fantastic. Another good question is, um, this question is uh, from another guest. How often my head and neck patients report they are not following up with their ENT until three months post completion of treatment? Does the research outline the best timeline for patients to follow up to monitor lymphedema development? Yeah, that's such a good um, thing. And I feel like I wish that uh, we could get this in front of ENTs because I, like even, I, I love my doctors, but they did not know about this. And so, um, or they didn't understand the significance of it and watching it and monitoring closely because um, we do the same thing here that my doctors will say, I'll see you in three months. I see them sooner than that um, and I'll scope them. But um, usually the ENTs only see them for three months. And so I think that there needs to be education um, around that with the, our otolaryngologists as well. Um, understanding. Uh, Dr. Moline is a physician that also um, does a lot of speaking for tactile and he's wonderful if you get a chance to, to hear him take that opportunity. Um, but he says, you know, literally when I went through medical school, lymphedema was like one paragraph in one book. And so um, I think it's, we're just now pulling this to the forefront. Excellent. Well, and it's, you are working so closely with your physician. So thank you for highlighting that and just the partnership that you have with them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just another good follow-up question. When do you recommend patients use the FlexiTouch and is it a protocol for all of your patients? Super good question. Okay, so in my head, and I don't know if this is right, but it seems to be working, um, I kind of use those strikes like what I talked about. And so we know from the research that people who have single modality treatment, like just radiation, um, have much better outcomes. And so, you know, I could see a patient with a T1, very localized tumor on his one vocal fold that receives radiation. He keeps eating, he doesn't have alternative feeding, keeps doing the exercises. And a lot of times I'm not seeing significant lymphedema with those patients. So like, do they need it? I don't think so. Like I haven't seen them, like maybe it will develop later on. Um, but that one, uh, I feel like that's, if they don't, if he hasn't developed it, um, and he's probably, you know, a lot of them are about a year out. So, um, but if they have uh, combined therapy, chemo radiation, chemo just increases the toxicity and the symptom burden for these patients like crazy. So combined therapy is one strike. Um, surgery, extensive surgery is, a, is strike two. And then strike three is if they kept eating and drinking and exercising during their treatment. And so if they keep eating and drinking and doing their exercises during treatment, that is impacting long term how they're going to swallow. And so that is kind of my three, those are my three big strikes. But even people with one strike um, is enough for me to fit them in a FlexiTouch if they have combined chemo radiation. Excellent. So good insight on what patients you are recommending. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Do you always obtain MBSS before treatment begins, Joy? So mine is a little bit different here since I'm in the otolaryngology practice. Um, I do see a lot of patients that aren't seen by my ear, nose, and throat doctors, but are seen by other ear, nose, and throat doctors in the community. Um, and so sometimes they will do a modified at, you know, within their hospital setting. Um, but actually now a lot of times 
those doctors are just letting me do the fees. And, you know, we can argue about like, is the MBS better? Or is the fees better? I could give you 10 reasons why a fees is better. And I could give you 10 reasons why an MBS is better. But I think that depends on your personal preference and really what you're looking for. Excellent insight. Next question is, I have an appointment with a patient next week with a patient presenting with dysphagia secondary to cancer treatments. How do I know FlexiTouch will be a good fit for this patient? Yeah, so for sure, look at his case history, look at what they did, um, and then I would be questioning about what he did during the treatment as far as eating and drinking, and so then you're in your head, you're thinking how many strikes does he have against him and where he's at. Um, I feel like if he hasn't had an instrumental exam, like you have to do an in instrumental exam because you don't know what you don't know. Like you don't know until you know. And so I'm super um, pro instrumental evaluations because I don't have x-ray eyes and I can't see unless I look. Um, and so then I would go from there. Has, is he a year out? Is he five years out? Is he 10 years out? Um, uh, one of the case studies that I didn't get to show, unfortunately, today was a patient that's 20 years out. Um, I did my myofascial release. Um, he, we actually improved his swallow significantly because he was supposed to get a peg. Um, and then um, for continued, like long-term management, he did end up getting a flexitouch. And I had a slide showing the improvement in range of motion. And um, then I'll actually, I'm writing a poster session for ASHA that I'll be presenting um, like fees, exam, fees, eat 10, and then a quality of life survey pre and post flex a touch as well. So, Excellent. okay. Yes, this is a really good clarification question. I was a little confused about your three strikes. I'm not an SLP. Is it bad to continue to eat and drink during treatment, or does that mean the patient is tolerating treatment better than most? Yeah, and so um, we want them to continue to eat and drink um, during treatment. And if at some point it gets unsafe for them to eat and drink, then we want them to continue to do, it's called Faringo size exercises. And so um, just like you guys want them to keep moving their arm if they've got lymphedema and exercising, um, we want them to keep working and, and even if it's just like a free water protocol, um, oral care is super, super important as we know. Um, but like, you have to continue to eat and you have to continue to exercise during those treatments. Yes, definitely just keeping the patient, like you said, the swallow structures in place. Um, next one is, do you typically recommend FlexiTouch for our palliative care patients? Oh, oh. I have not encountered that. Um, I do see though that um, patients report significant improvement in pain. And so if they're in pain, because of the, um, because of the acute swelling, then I think um, it certainly makes them more comfortable. Um, so that would be a reason why if there's pain, I would feel like. Um, and then if we can reduce the internal lymphedema that makes swallowing easier and allows them to continue to take food by mouth, that would seem like it would be a good thing for a palliative person. That's all about quality of life. And so uh, how can I get them to eat and drink during that time? How can I reduce their pain um, would be the two big things that I can think of off the top of my head. And I feel like it would be beneficial for, for those two things from what I've seen. Yes, quality of life. Thank you for highlighting that. Um, this is a really good clarif clarification question as well. Um, the question is um, actually more of a statement. The majority of lymphedema therapists do not know what a fees is. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Good Lord. So I did not say, so fees, F-E-E-S, that stands for flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. And so you guys are probably familiar with the x-ray, the MBS, where they take an x-ray, but I use a little flexible scope um, and very kindly and gently put it through their nose, over their palate, and then I have them eating and drinking. And for mine with these patients, I have them bring food from home and we have a meal and it might, they might have the scope down there for a half an hour. Um, but I see what's going on during their meal time. So they bring, you know, bologna sandwich and I bring 
Cheetos and whatever they normally eat. Um, so I can watch them what's typically happening over the course of that exam. And so that would certainly be one of the plus, pluses of the fees is that you can watch over long periods of time. Excellent. So there are many questions on usage with the FlexiTouch. Um, so we're going to combine a few of those to really hit home um, with your questions. Um, so the first one is, how long do they wear the FlexiTouch? How often? Yeah, so treatment um, for the head and neck is 32 minutes. And um, so basically like a half an hour. Again, I think, um, you know, when they came out, they thought that patients would be using it just once a day, but my patients will typically use it twice a day. They use it right away in the morning um, because that's usually when there's more accumulation of the fluid after um, laying down at night. And then a lot of times they're using it before they eat because they say, I can swallow better and easier uh, after I've used this device. Nice. And then ongoing, how long should they use it? Maybe I tell my patients, forever. I'm telling them, you are going to use this forever. So that was one of the things that I've learned about lymphedema is that it's a chronic progressive disease. So once they have it, they have it forever. And so um, I say for the first six months to a year, they'll be using it a couple times a day. Maybe later they can go down to several times a week. You know, the interesting part is, is that I don't think that anybody really knows the answer to that because this device hasn't been on the market long enough. I think it's only been out for like two years. I've been having it used with my patients for about a year. And so like, no, we don't know that, but knowing the disease progression, then they should expect to continue to use it forever is what I'm telling them. Yes. And thank you for just sharing that. It's definitely a, a chronic issue. So we appreciate that insight. And um, the next question really just goes on to, uh, is there a certain cert certification you have to go through before you use the FlexiTouch? No, there's not. And actually, um, we, the only part I play is saying, like, I'm kind of helping to decide who gets the device. Um, and I do that based on internal lymphedema. And so what you do is you contact your friendly tactile rep, and there is certainly one close by you probably. Um, you arrange a demonstration once you've gotten the okay um, from the physician. I have the tactile rep come here to this office and they uh, do the demonstration here. Um, they handle, like I send them a face sheet and the insurance information and they um, check with the insurance and do all of that for you and they'll have uh, the information when they come as far as patient cost or co-payments and all of that. And so, no, you just kind of sit and talk while they're having it. Um, I might look before and after, um, but like it, uh, the, the reps will do the demonstration for you. Excellent. Yes. Um, Julie, you've got a really great partnership with your, with your rep. <sighs> Shout out to Miss Bailey and Nick. Those are my reps. Love them. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so you've got this partnership. You, like you said, you're identifying a patient and then, um, they really take that guesswork off of you, like you said, with the insurance component um, on if it's going to cover or not. Um, so that's a couple of these questions. Is the FlexTouch covered by an insurance? And how costly is that for patients and so forth? So um, that is what the, the rep does for you. Is that, is that right, Julie? Yes, yeah. So yeah, I hate insurance companies. I'm sure all of you feel the same way. Um, but like, we don't really have to do any of that, which makes it lovely. Yes, thank you. Um, and then the question is, would insurance cover for palliative care? I don't know. Like it's kind of, like since it's such a new device, um, commercial insurances, like it's kind of hit and miss. Um, so I think it's your rep and tactile just kind of have to work through the insurance issues. A lot of it is based on your documentation and seeing that there is swelling. Um, so, but they, again, the company helps you in saying like, this is what we need. Um, and then you're able to provide that information to them so that they can go back to the insurance company. 
Exactly. Um, there are definitely many intricacies and we don't want you all um, to have to guess and say yes or no insurance will cover. Um, we, we are presenting medical need from your documentation and uh, provide that to the insurance company. So yes, take the guesswork out of it, make it, make it simple. Um, this is such a good question. Um, moving on to just the collaboration between SLPs and the physicians. The question is um, just actually more of a statement and background. We've been trying to team up and become close collaborators with our ENTs, but have experienced yes. some pushback <laughs> and lack of interest despite our attempt to explain the value of SLPs to the head and neck cancer patients. Oh, that makes me so sad. You know, any um, recommendations? Like I am so happy to share any of my pictures or slides or videos, like I have crazy videos of head and neck cancer patients and what their swallow looks like. And like, I am happy to share any of that with people. Um, you can email me and a lot of times it's a pretty, it's a bigger file. And so you have to go through Dropbox, um, but I'm all about sharing. And so whatever you would like, I feel like you can't argue with a picture. Um, and so they, I know it's hard, but you have to keep after them and show them like, we know we're the experts in this and we know what to do. And these patients are suffering. Mm -hmm, exactly. As a follow-up to that, how does your clinic run, Joy? And how do you partner with your physicians? So, um, so I am, again, super blessed to be with a group of ENTs that I love, love, love. And so when someone comes in with um, hoarseness or trouble swallowing, um, I will typically see them first. So I do uh, the endoscopy or a video stroboscopy first, and then the ENT comes in and reviews that with the patient and with myself to decide on a treatment plan. And so from the very beginning, it's like this team um, and then we pull in, you know, radiation and um, chemo doctors and other people as we need them into that. Um, I do, again, receive referrals from other ENTs and other um, cancer groups. Um, so then it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, but like we make it work and I, I have really close contact with the dietitians. <laughs> like I love dietitians. And so um, it's usually the dietitians and I, dietitians are with the oncology group. And so they are the ones that kind of facilitate a lot of the communication for me. 